We all might be in the same storm, but we are not all in the same boat. COVID-19 will push over 70 million people into extreme poverty in 2020 alone. COVID-19 has been challenging for everybody, but for people living in the developing world, the pandemic is a disaster on top of another disaster. Olam is a shared platform of over 50 Jewish and Israeli organizations that work in international development, humanitarian aid, and global service. Olam's partners are working in over 90 countries and are highly concentrated in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. They serve some of the most marginalized and vulnerable populations who lack access to basic services, health, education, and welfare. COVID-19 has made it more challenging for the organizations to continue doing their work. From loss of important funds, to recalling overseas staff and volunteers, to working remotely when many populations do not have access to remote technology. How have Alam's partners responded to these new emerging needs? No one is safe and healthy until everyone is safe and healthy. The pandemic has opened our eyes to the many global challenges that exist. These are challenges that transcend borders and the Jewish community is not immune from them and can take an active part in helping tackle some of these. This is also an opportune moment to look at our work with a critical eye and to ask questions about how we can build back better as a sector, how we can do our work more ethically. It is our new focal point. Good morning, afternoon, evening. My name is Diana Ginsberg, and I am the CEO of Olam, tuning in from my living room in Jerusalem. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our fifth annual Focal Point and our first ever virtual conference. Over the next 48 hours, over 275 practitioners, rabbis, communal leaders, funders, and service program alumni will come together to explore the world's most pressing challenges and ask what we as a Jewish community can do to step up at this time. This is our most diverse focal point yet. Close to 70% of you are first time attendees and you are tuning in from over 16 countries worldwide. The conversations we are about to have have never been more important. COVID-19 has revealed and compounded existing inequalities within and among societies and has disproportionately impacted the world's most vulnerable. The pandemic has also demonstrated our capacity to change our behavior and exercise responsibility in inspiring and radical ways. Yet it is difficult for many of us to find the time to deal with issues outside of our own immediate concern. We are tired, distracted, worried, grieving. Some of you have shut down programs and laid off staff. Others have been laid off yourselves. The Jewish community has suffered tremendous losses. And so I wanna start by saying thank you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for doing your best to block out distractions to be fully present. Thank you for expanding your hearts to care about the suffering of others. 
Thank you for being willing to grapple with questions that have no easy answers. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Olam's 50 plus partner organizations whose amazing work you just saw in the video and our staff, the best team one could hope for. I want to thank our conference sponsors, the Combined Jewish Philanthropies of Boston and Pact with Purpose, as well as our strategic partner, Shalom Corps, who works closely with us on tomorrow's plenary on the future of global service. Lastly, I want to thank Olam's funders and board members for their unwavering support. This Shabbat, Jews around the world will read from the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, which includes the stories of the creation of the world and Adam and Eve. There is a Midrash that teaches us about human beings' first experience of darkness. According to Jewish tradition, Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day of creation, just hours before the onset of Shabbat. Over the course of the Sabbath, they basked in a powerful primordial light. When the sun set for the very first time on Saturday night, Adam became terrified, scared that he would be engulfed forever in darkness. It was at this moment that God gave him the gift of two stones. And in an act of human ingenuity, Adam rubbed them together and produced fire. In this way, the creator of the universe endowed humanity with the power of creativity. And it is this event the Jews to this very day commemorate every Saturday night by lighting a candle as part of the Havdalah, Saturday, uh, the Havdalah ceremony. Like Adam, we too face a world that is full of darkness and uncertainty. And fear is a natural response. But like Adam, inaction and paralysis are not possibilities. How do we walk in the footsteps of our ancient ancestor and draw upon reservoirs of creativity to generate warmth and light in the face of overwhelming darkness? That is the question that underlies many of the sessions and experience that we'll have together over the next two days through our plenaries, workshops, interactive website, networking opportunities, and more. For our opening plenary, we are privileged to hear from a variety of experts in the fields of international development and humanitarian aid on trends, insights, and opportunities from recent months. Together, they will look at the question of how to build back better and use this time to build our work more ethically and sustainably. Our plenary will be moderated by Robert Bank, President and CEO of American Jewish World Service, AJWS. AJWS is a proud Olam partner and Robert is a veteran focal point attendee. Under Robert's leadership, AJWS has modeled for many, myself included, what it means to serve with humility and to hold our work to the highest ethical standards. The plenary includes four distinguished guests, Sasha Chanoff, founder and executive director of Refuge Point, a humanitarian organization that finds lasting solutions for the world's most at-risk refugees, Dr. Zvera Joseph Davy, an infectious disease epidemiologist based in South Africa, where she researches how to best prevent and treat HIV and other sexually transmitted infections in women, families, and children. Michelle Nunn, president and CEO of Care USA, a leading humanitarian organization that fights global poverty and provides life saving assistance in emergencies. And lastly, Pranita Kapoor, country advisor for India at AJWS based in New Delhi. I encourage you to look at the event website for their full bios. And in now it is my pleasure to turn over the virtual floor to Robert Bank. Diana. Thank you for your powerful remarks and for your kind words. Congratulations on Focal Point's fifth anniversary and thank you for your inspiring leadership. A warm welcome to everyone who has joined Focal Point 
and to those tuning in on Facebook. It's wonderful to be here with you. Before we get to our panelists, Diana has asked me to make some remarks at this dark and challenging time. Folks, I promise. My remarks will not all be filled with despair, doom, and gloom. But let's start with a dose of reality. We are living in the midst of a catastrophic intersection of crises. A deadly global pandemic, a battered global economy, a devastating global climate crisis, a massive refugee crisis, rising violence against women, unrelenting systemic racism, 270 million people facing acute food insecurity, the assault on democracy by authoritarian leaders here and around the world. Now in contrast to the ever presence of these crises, it is truly gratifying to be here today with you committed and visionary leaders coming together to counter these horrifying forces. For me, this conference is the antidote to everything going on around us. I wanna share two reflections with you before this panel starts. What about the kind of leadership I believe is demanded of us today? And the other about why that leadership is so crucial at this moment in world history. These dark times remind me of a powerful quote from Albert Camus' The Plague. His 1947 novel has been described as a sermon of hope because the narrator reminds us that even in times when people behave immorally, immorally in the face of exponential death, there are more things to admire in human beings than to despise. There are more things to admire in human beings than to despise. I like this idea of the Sermon of Hope and the belief that human beings tip more to being good than evil, despite what we see around us today. In my view, leadership today requires us to be unrelenting carriers of hope. We must remind ourselves and others that tragic and difficult moments in world history are actually invitations, invitations to act, opportunities to change the world for the better. And we can't squander them. I know that all of you are seizing these opportunities and for the next hour, we'll learn more about what we're up against and more about how we can turn hope into action. Which brings me to my second point. Yes, we are up against a unique threat, a unique threat. But in a sense, COVID-19 is not really unique. There's one thing that all pandemics have in common. They are most uniformly deadly for the poor and the marginalized, people whose human rights and dignity are not respected. Pandemics magnify injustice and inequality. Those who already live in poverty are far more likely to have no safety net. Those who already suffer discrimination because of their ethnicity, race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation, to name a few, are far more likely to suffer. And those who already live in authoritarian regimes are far more likely to have their rights further undermined. These are simple and tragic truths. And so it must be our mission as leaders to change these tragic truths. If we weren't paying close enough attention to systemic inequities before COVID-19, it's our responsibility to do it now because pre-existing inequities have become all the more clear and the stakes of letting them go letting them continue are staggeringly high. I want to close this brief introduction with the inspiring words of the author and public intellectual, ta Coates. He says, history has a weight, a weight, a gravity. If you're going to go in an opposite direction to history, you need to consciously exercise 
an opposite force. And so it is up to us to exert a stronger opposite force to overturn history. To do so, we must be unrelenting carriers of hope and we must, must, must push harder to rout out injustice. Being here with all of you today, I feel more confident than ever that we can do it. And with that, I'd like to turn to our panel. During this session, our panel of experts will look back at COVID's most critical challenges, share insights into what they've learned, and look forward to how we can build back better. I'm going to ask our panelists four rounds of questions, which will be followed by Q&A. We invite you to use the chat function both on Zoom and on Facebook, and we are looking forward to your questions. Now let's begin with looking back. I'm gonna start with a lightning round in which each panelist will talk for one minute. And I'll turn first to Dr. Deborah Joseph Davy, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist at UCLA and the University of Cape Town. Devorah, good afternoon in Cape Town. Welcome. Thank you, Robert. Great to see you. Good to see you. Looking back at the past eight to 10 months, what do you think is the single biggest shift or takeaway that you've seen in your field? Take it away, Devorah. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for the invitation and for the really inspiring opening to the session. So as we know, just 10 months ago, COVID-19 was identified, transforming life across the globe as we know it. Today, there are over 38 million confirmed cases worldwide with the United States leading the number of cases with almost 8 million, followed closely by India, Brazil, and Russia. I wish I could say this in the past tense, but we know that the pandemic is far from over. Some countries have been relatively successful in suppressing the virus, protecting their population, saving millions of lives, others have not. Over a million lives have been lost to COVID-19 with again, the US leading in that toll with over 215,000 lives lost. The disruption due to COVID and the national lockdown of schools, healthcare and industry will be immeasurable. For example, interruptions to antiretroviral therapy could lead to more than 500,000 extra deaths from AIDS related illnesses, including tuberculosis in Sub-Saharan Africa. The cost of the response has been over $11 trillion with an estimated 10 trillion loss in earnings. And the psychological impact of closing schools, the economic downturn, isolation will have long lasting effects. Similar to HIV, which is my area of research, the COVID pandemic has been surrounded by public denial, inattention, government cover up, cover up and outright disinformation. However, the COVID pandemic remains unprecedented in the outbreak in its size, scale, speed, and has highlighted the inequity in our society, as you rightly said, and resulted in an entirely unique measure of responses or failure to adequately respond, which we'll talk about later. Wow, a, a, a grave, grave dark situation indeed. Michelle, tell us about your situation running this huge NGO CARE. Thanks, Robert. And it's a, it's a real privilege to be with um, this extraordinary group. Uh, I um, think that uh, this is truly a um, an extraordinary moment. And uh, and so if you think about care, for instance, 75 years of history formed in the wake of World War II with the um, the creation of the first care packages, those that you might send off to your kid at at college or at camp actually came from the founding of the organization CARE. But we have never in our 75 year history uh, dealt with a global pandemic in which, for instance, we had to stand up uh, humanitarian responses in 69 countries at once, which is what we have done over the last number of months. We've reached over 21 million additional people. Um, and we, I think the, the thing that is, is different about this is not only the breadth of it, the global dimension of it in which uh, we are trying 
trying to do um, a, truly a global response, but at the same time, the layers of complexity and the the depth of the challenges, one on top of the other. So uh, it you know it starts with the health, but then that's progressed to hunger, and that's progressed to poverty, um, and then that's progressed to gender-based violence, and a whole host of ex just really um, very challenging, uh, very challenging and interdependent um, kind of problems that we need to be able to address collectively and cooperatively. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Over to you, Sasha. Hey, Robert. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. I, I love that. Um, unrelenting carriers of hope. That's what we all have to be and think about today. Refuge Point um, works, just to give you a little context, in about 30 countries across Africa and the world to identify refugees in life-threatening situations and help them resettle to the US, Canada, Australia, and other countries. <clears throat> in addition to that, we have a flagship program in Nairobi to help refugees stand on their own two feet and become self-reliant. Our focus is on solutions for refugees. Uh, in Nairobi and in other places where we support organizations to build self-reliance for refugees, we've seen immense and immediate desperation. I actually, I started Refuge Point with a Kenyan doctor in Nairobi because we saw so many refugees who fled from camps and fell through the cracks of humanitarian aid. Today, uh, the majority of refugees are no longer in camps, but in urban areas, and there are, are less systems in place there. So what we saw with COVID was an immediate vanishing of livelihoods and opportunities for income. And as Michelle said, that impacted people in so many different ways, but the urgency then and even now is for rent, for food, how are people going to survive day to day? So our, our focus is on unaccompanied children, refugees from LGBTI communities and others. And there's just tremendous desperation around identifying how people will survive. So if I look back to when Refuge Point started, it started because people fell through the cracks of humanitarian aid. Since that time, 15 years ago, there's been a lot of progress. But with COVID, what we see is refugees who are the most vulnerable who are falling through the cracks of aid again. Thank you, Sasha. Such a, such a comprehensive, palpable feeling about um, sort of the regress, unfortunately, because of COVID. Pranita, Good evening in New Delhi. Thank you for Thank being with us. From your perspective, headlines from a human rights perspective. Uh, thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, you know, human rights have been, have been impacting uh, marginalized communities across all of the countries that we work in in HAWS, including here in India. Uh, let me quickly take you through what uh, the marginalized groups in India are facing uh, as a result of COVID. Let's start with women. There's an increase in domestic violence. The, the UN is calling it the silent pandemic. There's a loss of income from the uh, from the, they're not being allowed to go out and work. Girls have a clampdown on mobility. They're um, reinforcing of gender roles by being at home. Uh, there's a massive increase in instances of early and child um, marriages, and they're having to drop out of school in droves. The LGBTI community is sheltering in place with those very families that have turned them out and abused them. Their circles of solidarity that they had built for themselves are completely shattered and um, there are no incomes. The Muslim community in India, for example, more specifically is facing hatred, distrust, and um, at, at every opportunity, the government and the media is putting them down. And finally, something that I'm sure everybody has been watching or, or it's been in the news at least for us is, is really the state of the, uh, our internal migrant workers, millions of them abandoned and left to their own devices within four hours, which is the time that it took to announce the lockdown in India. Uh, in big cities, no jobs, no food, uh, no shelter. They had to literally walk back hundreds of miles to their native villages just to stay alive. So on the surface of things, Robert, it feels a little like we might have gone back, I don't know, 15, 20 years in terms of progress. Yeah, well, thank you for that first lightning round. Um, we're going to take it a little bit slower now and take a breath. Wow, I think we all need a breath after that. And I want to ask you, experts in the field, um, difficult to answer this one, I know, because there's so many learnings. But if you have to choose one, what is the most significant learning from this period, this difficult, challenging period that you've all described? I'll turn back to you, Devorah, to kick us off with this round. 
So 10 months ago, uh, I, I, I would never imagine that we would be in this place where we'd be regressing, as Pranita said, and Sasha said, to such an extent. Um, I just wanted to give a, a little story of lockdown here in South Africa. Um, during the national lockdown here, we couldn't even go outside to walk our dogs. So we family stayed inside and we started to watch concerts on TV. And we were dancing in the living room with our young kids, Aiden and Sophia. And I remember crying one night that I thought that my kids would never get to go to a concert and rock out with others and sweat and dance, be unafraid of a contagious disease. And what I felt that in that moment was a sense of despair, hopelessness. But I have to say, I trust in science. And I know that we'll get back to a place where concerts, travel, or social distance, of course, and improved understanding of the virus and novel treatments mean that people infected are 30 to 50 times less likely to die from COVID compared to the spring. Despite this remarkable progress, it's gonna take an, an effective, inexpensive vaccine to the place where we can attend conferences like this one together again. Until then, mask wearing is gonna be remain the norm, along with social distancing, outdoor dining, and protecting our most vulnerable. So in a nutshell, I, I think that the, big, the biggest lesson learned right now is that we need to believe in science um, and we need to listen to the scientific experts. So infectious disease experts like Tony Fauci of the National Institute of Health of the United States are experts for a reason, should be respected, listened to and well-resourced. And that public health, just basic public health, old school public health works best. So we know that quarantines, disinfection, hand washing, limiting social contact are all remain effective to addressing this virus. So we need to listen to the experts and we need to believe in sci a scientific approach in addressing this pandemic and future pandemics. I can't tell you how much calmer I feel now. Thank you for that, Devorah. Sort of a voice of sanity, thank you, right? Um, can we turn it back to you, Michelle, for your single biggest learning. Yeah, hopefully we can all build upon one another because there are a number of learnings and certainly um, paying attention to and uh, investing in the science is a critical one. I think from a care perspective, I would say that, uh, that what we've learned is the lesson that we learned over and over again in, uh, in times of disaster and challenge, which is those who are already most marginalized as so many have articulated and Sasha and Pranita already articulated are, um, are most hurt in times of of, of challenge and humanitarian crisis. And we see that here in our own country in the United States. We see that globally around the world. We see that from a gender lens, care focuses and centers our work around gender. And we see the enormity of the inequities uh, uh, made real for us right before our eyes. It's taken the shroud away from um, any uh, sense of uh, equanimity we can have around, um, around issues of inequality. And so uh, we, for instance, look at women and girls and the disproportionate impact this is having on their livelihoods. And we've surveyed over 10,000 women and girls. Uh, and what we found is they are more um, hit around this in terms of hunger, in terms of also in terms of the loss of jobs, uh, in terms of their mental health, in terms of the caregiving responsibilities, uh, in terms of issues like gender-based violence. And so we, um, on the other hand, I think also have to look to, uh, and this is the hopeful part of the, of the lesson, which is um, how do we ensure that we are calling upon the entirety of the human capital in order to meet this challenge and to build back better? And so that means how do we make sure that women and girls are at the leadership tables? Um, we've studied reports, for instance, 74 hunger reports, uh, half of which did not mention women as a, as, a, as a way of looking at the challenge when we know that women are disproportionately impacted by hunger. So we have to make sure that we're listening and learning from 
putting uh, not only on the front lines, because we know that women are 70% of the caregiving front lines, but that we also have them at the leadership tables. Uh, and so if you look at, for instance, the task forces, COVID task forces around the world, on average, 24% are women, when 70 to 80% are frontline worker uh, in terms of the, um, the actual response. So we, um, we have to make sure that we are calling upon the entirety of our, of our human capital and our human potential, and certainly that we're addressing issues of, of equality in order for us to not only get through this crisis, but to ensure that we build back a better future. Thank you, Michelle, very much for that um, important, important learning and um, opportunity. Um, Sasha, over to you. Yeah, Michelle, thanks for highlighting um, how marginalized women are. And also when you talk about times of disaster and challenge, it just it reminds me precisely of what's happening in the refugee space. We're seeing the same marginalization marginalization of girls and women and increasing dangers that they're facing. But one of the things that that strikes me immediately about COVID is that there have been other shocks prior to COVID that also uh, are, are hugely detrimental to refugees. I'm thinking now specifically of the Dab refugee camp and insecurity that arose there a number of years ago that cut the humanitarian sector off from providing aid to refugees. Or when I think about 2015 and the World Food Program ran out of uh, money to provide food to hundreds of thousands of refugees in the Middle East. That sparked a mass migration to Europe because people felt that they didn't have any opportunities to support or care for or help their families to survive. So what is, and COVID, we're seeing the same thing. Refugees were actually cut off from aid. The organizations that were there to support them didn't have access to them. Uh, because many didn't have flexible funding, and at the same time, uh, they didn't have the opportunity to see people face to face. So what does this tell us? It actually tells us that we have to find a new way of supporting refugees, which puts them at the center of their own decision making. The humanitarian system is predicated on this idea that people should get emergency aid and then refugees will go home at some point. So billions and billions of dollars of aid are provided year after year uh, with the idea that people will go home. And it keeps people in lives of dependence, without dignity and often without hope for the future. That's before COVID. Now what we're seeing is they're cut off from aid during COVID. So the, the big learning that, that I think many of us see that we all see in the humanitarian space is that we have to put refugees themselves and refugee-led organizations at the center of their own response. We have to enable refugees to support themselves so they don't have to depend on other, others and erratic aid so that when it's cut off, they're still able to support themselves and survive. And when we looked around, we saw that very few people were actually focused on refugee-led organizations, and yet it was those organizations that were really on the front lines supporting their own communities. So we immediately posted on our website a list of refugee-led organizations in Nairobi to try to draw donors and support to those. So I think the big takeaway here is that we have to really think about transforming humanitarian response so that refugees are at the center of that. And, and as Michelle said, at the table. So they're making decisions about their own lives and their own futures. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Pranita, over to you on this question. Thank you, Robert. Robert. Uh, my uh, learning movement came about uh, 10 days into the lockdown, and it's going to match a lot with what Sasha just said. Uh, in the face of all of the challenges that I had outlined above, um, what I started to see, what we started to see here, was the power of what we call grassrooted work. And, uh, you know, a grassrooted approach is the essence and the core of the work um, that HWS does. And um, it is one that actually starts and begins and ends with our partners. Uh, and these are partners that belong to the community that they work in for the most part. Uh, we believe, just as you said, that they are best positioned to come up with solutions to their problems and basically go around building a constellation of partners uh, to try and reach the mo most at-risk populations across both rural and um, urban geographies, but also locally uh, as well as nationally. Um, now, what we saw was that um, all of these years of work uh, with the most marginalized, whether it was mobilizing them or building collectives, uh, you know, investing in the political education of women and girls, 
uh, strengthening their leadership. It all kind of came to fruition. It all came together um, when, it, when it was time to, to lead uh, relief and rehab, rehabilitation work. Uh, to those that were most impacted by the pandemic. And if I just can, I, can I give you, if I can just give you two examples, uh, you know, of, of how it worked. So partners uh, were ready to provide aid, but because of the lockdown, uh, just as Deborah said, but no one was allowed to leave their homes. Now, the because their community, they were in the communities that they served, uh, the girls and women and young people who were part of the collectives that they had been mobilizing and strengthening all over these years were their eyes and ears, were sending them lists these are the families that need food now. This house has a woman facing violence. Somebody needs to help get to her. This house has no medication. Can you please help? So suddenly that became, uh, you know, uh, that became the group that was giving them information. Uh, that's one level of grassrooted work that worked during the time, um, has been working. Another example is at a slightly different um, level uh, where another partner of, our, one of our partners here in Delhi was, um, uh, works with with the with labor, and we have three about three million migrant labor population. That's not state domicile of Delhi that comes into work. Now the state government was willing to offer relief, but these people these people had no papers to avail of that relief. So uh, the partners worked together with others, lobbied with the government, and said, just for this once, just for these few months, can we give them the relief material? Can we put their names on the rolls? And they did it. They managed to get an order. They started to give them food. And now they've got their foot in the door. And now they're negotiating and saying, wait a minute, uh, these same guys, can we, you know, when they start coming back to work and slowly they're trickling back, can we start giving them, uh, you know, medical aid, accidental insurance? So, you know, building on what happened during the pandemic, where they were able to move because of the work that they had been doing before, taking them to another position now. So I think just countless uh, examples such as these and indeed across all of the countries that we work in uh, just prove that uh, when the chips are down, this grassrooted approach is the one that works. Thank you, Pranita, for that. Um, you know, I think that round was so much about sort of who's at the center of the solution. And thank you to all of you for your thoughtful um, responses. Before we go to the next round, which is an important round, because it's really about this entire conference, which is, you know, we're in a catastrophic global pandemic with so many other um, pieces and multi layers connected to it. How do we build back better, right? But before we go there, I want to just remind the audience um, thank you for being here. We want to hear from you. Um, please, please ask some questions in the chat. And you can use chat either in Zoom or in the Facebook um, modality. So, um, and now I'm going to turn back to the panel, but please do um, ask your questions and the panelists will be happy to answer them um, at the end of the panel. So we're talking about this piece right now about building, building back better. And I know we all agree that building back better doesn't mean returning to the old normal, you know. Um, and so, Michelle, let me start with you in this round. What is CARE's programmatic agenda for building back better? You've obviously spoken to that somewhat in what the learnings have been, but what are you thinking about for the future? Thanks, Robert. Uh, yes, I, there, I think we all recognize the, um, the, I would say the, the enormity of the challenge that's before us. And I think that we are um, trying to put before us, how do we move through this crisis at the same time that we uh, give hope and possibility for the longer term, more equitable systems and structures that we can put in place. So, um, you know, we have a focus on defeating poverty and centering women and girls. So that will continue to be uh, primary in terms of the work that we're doing. We also believe that so many of these issues are, um, are interdependent. And so we work on both women's economic empowerment, but also food, nutrition, water systems, um, issues of, of health and health equity health systems uh, and um, and then also the emergency response. So we we as have been has been very well articulated are also looking to how do we center and I think one of the things we've learned is 
um, if the, the relearning, let's say, of, of how powerful and resilient communities are and how those local leaders can and should be at the center of our response, both in terms of how we structure our work, how we resource our work, but also um, whose voice we listen to and how we lift up those voices to be at the decision making tables. So, um, so that's very much, I think, um, central to CARE's work. Just a couple of things that might be of interest that we've, that, uh, that show, I think, also the nature of what this crisis has revealed. CARE, after 75 years of working only outside of the United States, has in the last months pivoted and is working and is working in the United States because we see the stagnant and stubborn poverty. We see the enormity of the inequities. We see issues of hunger that are profoundly powerful here. So CARE has um, is taking some of our lessons from the last 75 years and applying them here. We also are, um, I think there is this importance of agility and, um, and also as again, Sasha and Panita have very well articulated centering uh, those who are, um, who are who are at the at the at the edge of the of the crisis in our response so we're doing a lot more cash distribution as an example and making sure that we're putting in the hands of the people who are struggling and suffering the decision making power that comes with cash assistance as just again one example we're also looking again throughout all of it at the gender based lens we're looking at that from the perspective of um you know, as if you look back at the Ebola crisis as an example, uh, there were as many women who lost their lives in um, issues of maternal mortality as the Ebola crisis itself because of the displacement of health systems. And so what are, for instance, the sexual and reproductive health implications when a, when a health system is so severely strained? Um, how are we continuing to support women around their reproductive choices around family planning? Um, how are we addressing the epidemic of gender-based violence? So uh, keeping a gender lens in all of the work that we do, both in terms of crisis response and long-term response. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, very, very powerful to hear that CARE is pivoting to do work in the United States. Mm. Um, Sasha, from your angle, what does the world community need to build back better? I, I love this question. Um, because I feel like when there are global crises or challenges that are hugely complex, no single organization is going to be able to address those alone. And one of the tacks and one of the orientations of Refuge Point is to identify more effective ways of, of um, in advancing solutions for refugees and building coalitions around those. Uh, right now, as I've said, we need to put refugees at the center of their own uh, lives in the sense that they need to be able to make the decisions about their own lives. Refuge Point has worked with the Women's Refugee Commission to build a global coalition of organizations that we call the Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative. That includes the IKEA Foundation, a number of other foundations, the State Department, a number of governments, and a lot of the biggest NGOs in the world, as well as many refugee-led organizations. And the goal of the Self-Reliance Initiative is to advance self-reliance opportunities for refugees, to build an evidence base of what works best so we can scale up those solutions, and to um, advance advocacy and programming that will enable refugees to stand on their own two feet. So we've, we've uh, made a lot of advances in this, and we see that this aligns directly with the global compact on refugees, which the UN affirmed uh, a number of years ago, and self-reliance is one of the four pillars uh, of the global compact on refugees. In addition to that, one of the things that Refuge Point does is help refugees in life-threatening situations get to places where they can rebuild their lives. And we're seeing a lot of new opportunities in the refugee resettlement space. One of them is a program that we're building with the UN Refugee Agency and the International Refugee Assistance Project to reunite unaccompanied children with parents in EU and other countries. And there's a lot of opportunity to increase that program and others that help refugees legally and permanently relocate. And I would just say one last thing, Robert, and I know I'm a little above my two minutes and you're keeping us to a strict timeline, but I wanted to share something from kind of a leadership perspective and one of my learnings as well. I saw very immediately that there is a huge amount of competition for 
resources in the humanitarian space and, and in the nonprofit space overall. And I think this competition really limits collaboration. Uh, we've taken a different approach, which is to really uh, try to support other organizations, connect them with funders, connect them with resources so they can do the great work that they're doing. And I find that this orientation of being, um, of supporting others and thinking that there's a, a lot of resources out there available for everybody, so you should make those connections, has actually enabled us to forge more coalitions that at their base support more refugees more effectively and enable people to share information and resources more. Terrific, thank you, Sasha. More collaboration, support other organizations. Um, Pranita, over to you. Um, to answer your question, Robert, I, I would like to quote um, a senior activist here in India. Her name is Shushma Ayengar. And uh, she was speaking to some of our partners recently, and she said, don't be rigid. If we resist change, transformation won't happen. Instead, for a moment, become academics from activists. Take the time to understand what is happening. Identify and capture the shifts. Look at what we don't know with curiosity rather than with fear. Prepare yourself to adapt to the new environment for creativity thrives when we don't know. And uh, I think we've been seeing uh, how activists um, around the country here are, are already starting to, to build along these lines. Uh, they're keeping dialogues intact. We've seen um, new alliances being forged across movements. Uh, technology is coming to their aid like never before. Geographies are not a challenge anymore. I think this is something that we're gonna to continue to use uh, to build back. Um, they continue to visibilize the unspoken and un unseen issues of the marginalized communities. Uh, we spoke, I spoke about the, uh, about the migrant workers. Similarly, you know, setting up overnight helplines for uh, women, um, you know, uh, uh, survivors of domestic violence. Uh, we saw a coming together when, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a provision to potentially raise the age of um, marriage for adolescent girls. We're seeing it currently as um, uh, there is a change in laws uh, procuring, uh, pertaining to the pr procurement of um, uh, produce for small and marginal farmers. And uh, you know, different movements are coming, uh, are coming together to try and uh, you know, visibilize these issues. They're doing it by collaborating with an alternative media. And they're doing it also to express dissent and to build political resistance. I think these are some of the ways that uh, the pathways that, uh, you know, following on, on Shushma's lines, you're thinking, going it slowly, uh, you know, trying to find the opportunities there um, and, and, you know, slowly forging the ways ahead. Thank you, beautiful. Think like an academic and an activist. Interesting, thank you for that. Devora, from your perspective, building back better. I'm also gonna quote from another expert, Dr. Tedros, who's the head of the World Health Organization. He said, recently, when it comes to preparedness, our biggest obstacle is ourselves. Short-term self-interest is simply not sufficient. It is a basic principle of public health. No individual alone can protect themselves from an outbreak. No nation can act alone in a pandemic. This is really powerful considering the current position of the WHO. Um, to build back better, I do love the question as well, like Sasha said. We don't, know. we don't know, infectious disease pandemics can either come once in a lifetime or occur every few years. So we talked about the 1918 flu, we talked about different pandemics, they're unpredictable. But if COVID's taught us anything, it's that as a society, as a society we're not fully prepared nor capable to tackle the majority of health epidemics that we're currently facing or will face in the future. I'm gonna list a few lessons that we've learned and, and that will continue to contribute to building back better. The first one I mentioned earlier is to listen to experts, to listen to the science. The second is really about that viruses have no borders. It's really detrimental when government officials and health experts lie or underreport data about epidemics. So unrestricted, accurate, effective international communication with governments and scientists are essential. Rapid responses and mobilization are needed to control transmission, including the use of data, big data and scientists um, to control epidemics before they become pandemics, global epidemics. And as I mentioned earlier, old school public health 
still works. It works well. Aggressive quarantines, hand washing, social distancing remain effective along with early testing, reporting, treatment, and contact tracing. And a vaccine will only work if people use them. So along with accelerated vaccine testing, we also need to build confidence around vaccines in parallel. And finally, there's an urgent need for global leaders who believe in science. We all need governments that believe in science, fund it adequately, address the chasms that we've all talked about caused by inequity due to racism, poverty, refugee status, lack of healthcare that we have in the United States, South Africa, my new home and other societies. To quote Dr. Tedros again, his other quote that I liked, um, we do not know when the next health emergency will be, but we know it will come, we must be prepared. It's the same reason we mandate seatbelts, invest in fire departments and vaccinate our children. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. That is actually such a great segue into the next round, Devora, um, which is, very connected to this idea of um, sort of who is responsible because it can't be obviously one organization. So from your perspective, where each of you sit, what is the top thing you and your sector needs from global leadership to build back better? Let me start with you, Michelle. Yeah, I would I would just frame it around um, the themes of collaboration, cooperation, um, and global thinking. Um, in addition to, I would say, uh, looking to local leadership with global cooperation. Um, and at its best, I think that's that's where we need to be. Um, I think we we have seen uh, the interdependence um, that we all have in the most profound possible way. Uh, and I think we also have um, have seen that no one sector can solve these problems. And in fact, even within our own sectors, we have to collaborate as Sasha has well articulated. Um, so I, I think that uh, we can't we can't turn away from the very um, international institutions that that actually are 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 are, are sort of vehicles through which we can cooperate. Um, and we can certainly look for regeneration and reform over time, but we have to invest now in those institutions and in our capacities to deliver against that. I would also just say that um, that cooperation must entail resourcing. Um, if you if you look at, for instance, the U.S. government's response is roughly equivalent in terms of our international investment uh, for COVID to what we invested in the Ebola crisis. That was in three countries. So think about that differential. Um, and we we have to demonstrate um, that we we know that we have to invest, and that investment is going to um, is going to have to be cooperatively. Um, uh, done. So we can turn to the private sector for the development of vaccines, and we must, but in order for them to be equitably distributed, we have to have multilateral institutions and governments coming together to cooperate around how we do that. So um, I guess this is a plea for all of those who are individuals and have a voice to advocate for that within your uh, within your own um, governments and within your own institutions. And, um, and I think a plea, plea for all of us to ensure that we are meeting the threshold that's required before the COVID pandemic hit, we already were at only half of the resources that were needed to respond to the humanitarian crisis. So if you think about now what's necessary, we have to invest in equality um, and in uh, our capacity to, uh, to ensure basic human rights for, um, for, for uh, the next, you know, the, the next uh, phase of what we hope will be um, the, uh, you know the 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 building back better mm -hmm. michelle um you know i i'm thinking about next year's focal points and um i really the next year's and um hoping that what we're not discussing is the inequality in the distribution of vaccine so thinking about that earlier is so important um sasha let me turn this one over to you about um, you've spoken about collaboration, cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, what is most needed with the refugee, migrant, and internally displaced people crisis in the world today um, from global leadership to build back better? 
Yeah, I would emphasize again the necessity of putting refugees first at the center of response. So they're the decision makers. It's interesting, you know, I've been working in the refugee space for over 25 years now with the UN for many years and NGOs, and then 15 years ago started Refuge Point. And the conversation with refugees is often one based, uh, or historically is one based on trauma and what you've gone through. You meet with people and you try to elicit the, their story of persecution. Why did you flee? What have you gone through? But what, what you see when you put refugees first and think about self-reliance and what strengths they can bring to the table to support themselves is that conversation changes to what is your background? What did you do? What can you do to support yourself? And it's a, it's a, a, a shift around dignity. It puts people in a place of dignity where they can speak to their strengths and abilities. And when you do that, we've seen in Nairobi and in a shift in, in how people respond to that. So we have to think about dignity and put refugees first. I would emphasize also collaboration. I would emphasize government leadership. Over this time in the past few years, Canada has played a wonderful leadership role in the refugee space and created new innovative programs. We're working with them right now on a labor mobility pilot project to connect refugees with skills, uh, uh, refugees who have backgrounds and skills that are needed in Canada because Canada can't find those among its own workforce. And, uh, and so this labor mobility project has global applicability when Canada does it. And historically, when the US has taken a leadership role, other countries and governments follow. Similarly, individually, when we take a leadership role, when we stand up for what we believe in, we inspire others to do the same and to follow us. So I think on every level, we need to stand up for what we believe in. We have to put refugees at the center. We have to think about new and creative ways to collaborate. And in those ways, hopefully we can come together more and help to address this unprecedented situation that we're in. Thank you, thank you. Turning to you, Pranita, on this question of global leadership. Uh, I'm going to take your uh, question in take your uh, question in light of uh, keeping keeping with our grassroots uh, grassrooted approach. What would uh, grassroots human rights activists need from uh, global leadership and aid organizations, for example? Uh, I'd say um, trust in their leadership, in their vision, and in their analysis of what is happening at the grassroots level. Uh, help them as they maintain a focus on the most marginalized communities, even as funding priorities change. Um, I think stay with them and support with support them, even if their ideas may not be around scale, but are around smaller but significant ambitions. And finally, I think uh, need to be flexible and be ready to change um, to be responsive. Thank you, thank you very much. And Devora, I know you've touched on this, but what is the key thing that, from your epidemiology and health um, publics? public science space. Um, is there anything you want to add about what is needed from global leadership? Yeah, I, I think that never before have we had the science, the resources, the technology to deal with such a threat. But we've also been forewarned of the dangers of this pandemic, but it's re revealed um, a collective failure to take the pandemic preparedness, prevention and response seriously and prioritize it accordingly especially to the most vulnerable. It's exploited and exacerbated the fissures within our society and exploited our own inequalities, as we've all said. Um, so really effective leadership requires leaders to act in an, in an urgent, honest, humble fashion, recognizing that mistakes are inevitable and not assigning blame as a way to deal with the mistakes when they occur. If we wanna really say with confidence as we did after the Holocaust and after the genocides, never again. So never make COVID happen again. We need to put ourselves in other people's shoes and feel with empathy, think with intelligence and science and use all of our positions of authority. All of us are leaders. So we need to use all of our positions of authority to make a path for all of us to go forward. Great, thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, I want to thank you all for your enormous expertise and insights into this overwhelming time in, in human history. Um, and yet 
listening to you all makes it so clear that there are solutions if we follow a certain kind of pattern of themes. And I'm not going to um, add them all up because you've done that so well. What I'd like to do right now is actually turn over to some comments and questions from the audience that um, I've been receiving. Um, let me start with a question from um, someone who is writing from, I believe, um, from Africa, from East Africa, and is basically saying that, um, I think that the major problem is that COVID is putting a huge spotlight on the failure of current systems, government, international agencies to properly manage the world's resources. What are your thoughts on this? I think some of you have touched on that already, but what are your thoughts with respect to the management of the world's resources and how COVID has identified this specific problem? This person writes about um, being in a place like Ethiopia, where there are so many other threats about food insecurity, water management, locust infestation, et cetera, in East Africa. Um, large problems of infrastructure. Um, can I turn this one over to you, Michelle, to take? Yeah, I mean, that's an awfully big question and an awfully good question. Uh, and I think that um, that really, in, in many ways, the, the global pan this pandemic should force us to face existential questions around our structures and systems and the equity. Um, and um, and I think it's the, the theme of, as, of this gathering is so. So how do we move through this, not only respond to it, but also um, use it as fuel to to create positive change and and so I definitely think, um, as I've heard said, and as I've said, you know, we can't unsee what we have seen in uh, in this pandemic. And so I think it does call upon us to think about um, where our resources are going. Why are we failing to resource, for instance, our humanitarian responses around the world? Why are we failing to ensure that we are um, that we are giving hope and possibility for refugees to rebuild their lives? Why are we failing in um, so many measures, structure, and around um, and around equality, which we are seeing uh, laid bare here, and uh, and so I don't think there's any one uh, set of solutions, but I think it is um, required for all of us as citizens um, to uh, to to challenge ourselves, our institutions, and our leaders to reimagine the world as we go forward. Thank you. Big answer to a big question. Appreciate it. Let me turn now to something that really came up as a theme. Here's a question from someone who says, um, how do you balance the express need, express need for community consultation and community-led solutions, which many of you have spoken about, um, together with an urgency of responding in pandemic times? I think I'm gonna ask Pranita to respond to this one. The balance sorry uh, so it's about the urgency of responding and it's about consulting communities yes. and i think that if uh, the community is not far away from you but is actually a part of you which is what we've been uh, i think trying to say that if you are if the organization that's responding with urgency is the community belongs to the community then your responses are based right there uh, you know when we're talking about consultation it's a whatsapp group it's it's not more difficult than that and I mean, you know, <clears throat> it's so, you know, it, it's, it's actually not that difficult uh, to do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing if you're thinking about like a national response in a country like India, they're not asking anybody for consultations anyway, but for organizations like us, it's very, very easy because I, I think of the way that we are um, embedded uh, or our partners are embedded within the communities that, uh, that they work with. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you for that. Um, another very interesting question that I think sort of really brings it home to how do we each live in this pandemic individually and connect to larger, the larger global issue of wanting to help. So there's a question that says, with so much information and misinformation and competing priorities these days, how do you recommend people get better acquainted with these issues and start getting involved to help. <clears throat> Devorah, can I turn that one to you? 
Sure. Um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. I think that the best way of getting, I, I'm going to reflect back on the, on the previous question about the community as well, is, is getting involved in your community. When the COVID uh, pandemic hit here, I was very involved in my research and I had to take a step back and volunteer my community to understand what COVID, what was happening. I volunteered with a local organization I'd never worked with before and started doing contact tracing. So following up with people that had been in contact with um, somebody that was infected. And I started calling them with my cell phone. And I learned so much about the virus and talking to people and how it affected people. And learned that people were starving. You know, people were literally starving because of the lockdown. And I had no idea, um, you know, working in a university. And so we, we ran this whole food campaign for uh, the community. But that was just reaching out to the community, volunteering, and listening to people's stories. Um, try to get off of social media and, and read real news um, if you can. But I also think just talk to real people. I think that's really important um, and reaching out in your community to learn more <laughs> how best you can help and, and learn from their experiences. Robert, can I add something to that one? Of course, please. Re Refuge Point um, has, is in these kind of uh, social entrepreneurship circles, I guess. There's, there's, there's funding from organizations that are looking at innovation uh, or foundations that are looking at innovation. So, so I often point people when they're interested in different issues to some of these foundations. Um, they're, they're ones that I think people here know about, like Skoll Foundation, Ashoka, Echoing Green, Draper Richards, Kaplan Foundations. These are foundations that are often identifying some of the most effective early stage or, or not so early stage responses to crises that are both national and global in nature. So I enjoy pointing people to those organizations and to those foundations because they are identifying really effective responses. Yeah, beautiful point, thank you. I think that's so true right now. I, I rely on a colleague to point me to grassroots organizations in the United States that are doing excellent activism work around um, our upcoming election, for instance, um, with um, marginalized communities here in the United States. So, so thank you for that, Sasha, um, for adding that. There's a question here that um, I'm going to sort of wrap up. Michelle, there's a direct question for you about, um, I was surprised and pleased to learn that CARE is now providing services within the US. I haven't found much information online. Can you expand a bit about what you're doing domestically? And then I'm gonna combine that with another question that you can start, but then I think everyone can maybe chime in which is a challenging question, I think, for anyone who's leading an organization to answer, but it's a legit question for sure, um, that in the for-profit sector, we see companies are impacted differently by COVID-19. Similarly, in the humanitarian aid sector, the question to the panelists is, which organizations do you expect will survive the crisis? And I'm sure the person isn't asking you very specific names of organizations, but which, um, do you expect will survive the crisis, which will collapse, and which may come out stronger? So, Michelle, if you could start with the first part about domestic, and then in the United States, uh, we've got a global audience, so just want to remind us that, as I sometimes do when we're talking in a global context, that the United States is just one of 195 countries in the world. Um, but let's start here, and then um, let's Let's talk a little bit about this, you know, the challenge for, um, for organizations during this time. Michelle. Yes, so I will I'll quickly talk about our US programming, which is which just been we've just created and is in, I would say, still pilot uh, form in the United States. One is we've taken um, the micro savings program that we do around the world in 50 plus countries, uh, small groups of largely women that save together. Uh, and we have over 7 million people that are a part of that. And we are applying that to the US context in pilot form. Um, so for instance, we know that in the US, you know, an average family can't afford a $400 emergency. So if we can put together saving circles, we can help support them and they can also potentially start small businesses. So that's one idea. And that's that we're that we're moving forward with and have pilots 
going. And the other idea is what we call Care Package Relief Corps, which is uh, a partnership with a set of gig platforms like TaskRabbit and Uber and Lyft, in which we are recognizing that so many people have lost employment or are underemployed. And uh, we are engaging them in paid work to deliver food to those who uh, need it, who are homebound. And so um, it's an example of CARES Hunger Work, but applied in the US in a new context. And we've gone from working in one city to working in uh, five cities um, in just a short period of months and delivered, well, by the end of the year, over a million meals um, in addition to producing jobs. So that's um, one example. And I would say that um, it is very hard to predict um, how we will, how, what, how organizations will fare over time in this moment. I think uh, some of that will depend on the resourcing and whether people will continue to, which I have seen in these last months, support organizations that are doing this essential work. I hope that that's true. I think that those of us um, who are, who have locally centered solutions and also who are, uh, I would say, um, you know, agile and innovative will be uh, those that I, I think will will hopefully emerge stronger as we go forward. Great. Um, I, thank you. I think um, I think we'll stop there on that one because I think probably everyone would say the same thing. And um, thank you for the question. There are many, many questions from the audience. I want to thank you all um, who are tuning in for these questions. Unfortunately, we have time for one last one. And it's a very sort of profound question um, that I think is directed at Sasha because it's um, about resettling refugees in Canada. And this is from someone who works on this issue and says, um, you know, we're finding there are many more country, concrete needs for direct services, but recent research shows that COVID has never negatively impacted Canadians' attitudes towards immigrants, refugees, and immigration overall, which is surely not unique to Canada. At a time where there is an even greater humanitarian need for refugee resettlement, people and governments may be less inclined to support it as a result of people suffering economic hardships. Um, I think we've seen this in other times in history for sure. Um, so much work to do in the area of direct services, but also in outreach to support it. Um, your comment on this, it's really more of a comment, a sad commentary. Um, Sasha. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Robert. Just so back to the, the last question, which will survive the crisis? <clears throat> I immediately went to the political crisis in the US right now and uh, the upcoming election and the fact that uh, Joe Biden has put out a statement on World Refugee Day about his commitment to refugees, to refugee resettlement, going back to and building on the commitments that the Obama administration made. And that gives me cause for a huge amount of hope. At the same time, the current administration has, uh, has knocked the knees out from under the resettlement program. And if that continues, the US resettlement program may you know, it's on its last legs right now and may not survive another four years of this administration. We are seeing rising xenophobia in many places. Thankfully, the Trudeau administration has really stepped up and taken a leadership role. And so I, I again, back to one of the other questions about what can we do, thinking about how to break down uh, xenophobia the growing xenophobia everywhere and recognizing there are a lot of great organizations that doing do that, but recognizing the contributions that refugees make to our society, to our economy and to our lives when we know them is I think critical. And if we do that, and if we share those with others and if others have opportunities to meet with and connect with refugees, that helps to break down those barriers of xenophobia. And that feels really critical in today, in today's kind of climate and crisis. Well, well, really, thank you for that, Sasha. I sort of actually felt myself getting kind of those little goosebumps, I think we used to call them, around sort of the, the xenophobia and the feeling um, of dehumanizing people, especially at a time when we're all going through something um, where we should be coming together. So thank you for everyone for really speaking about this local-centered listening approach, which you all speak to so beautifully. You know, we have just a few minutes left and um, I wanna again thank the audience so much for your interest, for your questions. There were many, many questions we were unable to get to, um, but that just shows how thoughtful 
um, this group of people tuning in is. What I'd like to end with with each panelist, um, sort of, because this is where I'm feeling. I'm feeling very hopeful right now um, because I'm listening to experts in the field and leaders in the field. Um, and I'd love to ask each of you, and I'll give the audience a little bit of insight into the fact that um, I actually ask the panelists um, to send a picture in of something that relates to this question. So um, I wanted to ask you who and what is keeping you hopeful, you who hold so much on your shoulders in your leadership roles, who or what is keeping you hopeful during this crushing chapter in our human history? So let me start with you, Devora, in Cape Town. And um, we're gonna put up a picture that you have actually submitted accompanying what you're going to say. So I'm waiting to see the picture. And there we go. Wonderful. This picture uh, gives me hope because of all of the activities and all of the Black Lives Matter and the protests that have been happening um, in the United States, but also in several other countries around the world. It brings me hope because it addresses the, the racial injustice that I referred to earlier, addressing the COVID transmission and deaths, but also to other diseases as well, like HIV, tuberculosis, malaria. We're not gonna end this pandemic or prevent future pandemics if we don't address the underlying systemic racism and inequities that we find in our societies across the globe. So this is a picture of nurses wearing masks coming out for Black Lives Matter. And I read the article associated with it. Uh, when nurses come out and protest for equal health, it brings me hope that in the coming days, weeks and months, we're gonna listen to these experts, including these black nurses. And we're gonna lead with empathy, put ourselves in their uncomfortable nursing shoes and move ahead forcefully. Thank you. Thank you, Devora. Michelle, over to you. Yes. Um, so Robert, thanks. Uh, I, I, um, the picture that I shared is of uh, a, a extraordinary woman named Salome Tu, um, who is from Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, she, along with millions of women like her, give me hope every day. In fact, there's sermons of hope, uh, Robert, to your um, uh, Camus uh, illusion. And um, Salome Tu was married at the age of 13 against her will. She had four children by the time she was 20. Um, she was beaten repeatedly by her husband. She um, learned about CARES uh, savings groups that I alluded to earlier. She joined one and she uh, became a businesswoman. She also um, emerged from that, uh, bought cars for um, her children to start taxi services. Uh, and um, alongside of that, she brought the idea of this village savings and loan program to her own communities and has been responsible for over 4,000 people joining savings groups in Cote d'Ivoire. So right now she is one of many women that are fighting against gender-based violence um, and who are spreading uh, the right information about um, how to prevent the spread of the virus of COVID. And, uh, and so I, we also see so many of these groups creating care packages for those who are, um, you know, for instance, begging in their communities or who have more than six children. So there is an extraordinary ripple impact and extraordinary resiliency from uh, those who are on the front lines and leading the way. Thank you. Thank you. Sasha. Yeah, the, um, is the photo there? Um, there, oh, there is. oh my gosh, one. Yeah, this is a photo of two of our board members, Sandra and George at the White House Correspondents Dinner a number of years ago. And this, this photo gives me hope for a number of reasons. One is that, as I said, the Biden administration is building on the Obama administration's leadership role, uh, uh, you know, a potential Biden administration with commitments that will place the US back in a leadership role around refugee resettlement and refugee action globally. It gives me hope primarily because Sandra is such an inspiring person. Uh, she, she resettled to the US 
uh, when she was 10. She started speaking about her experiences. She speaks in a lot of places. So if anybody wants one of the most dynamic speakers you could ever find, you can, you can find her, Sandra Uiringi Imana, who wrote a book called How Dare the Sunrise. And when you speak to her, she reminds me of the fact that people who are refugees and former refugees contribute immeasurably to our community, our society, and our lives. And, uh, and it's just a lesson that everybody has to learn, has to understand, and really you have to internalize. And when you connect with Sandra, when you listen to her speak, you're able to internalize that message. Thank you, Sasha. And Pranita, I'm gonna give you the last word on hope as you are in this moment. Okay, so uh, what you're seeing is a group of young girls sitting in front of you, uh, not being very physically distant, I know, uh, but masking their noses and mouths with their dupattas or uh, their scarves. To understand why this photograph gives me hopes, actually, you have to be able to see what is not in the frame. So I want to help you do that. Uh, these are young girls who belong to the Muslim community in a very remote part of our country where our partner Ahmed works. Um, the first time I spoke, I spoke about how girls are dropping out of school in droves. Well, these are girls that are part of that demographic. Um, their struggle goes back to well before the pandemic. Uh, they had fought so hard against their families, the community, village elders, uh, just to go into school and stay there. Um, and uh, then comes the pandemic and um, schools are now shut or they're online. And the rest of the world is learning online on their devices. These girls, as you can imagine, have access to none. The only device they do have really is themselves their community of young, uh, the other young girls around them and their hope. And so you see them sitting together and studying, making sure they're gonna keep up their grades and stay enrolled because if they don't pass their exams, they're not gonna make it to the next grade. If they don't make it to the next grade, they're gonna be pulled out of school. If they're pulled out of school, really nearly pushed into an early marriage, housework, motherhood. This picture brings to light the spirit of these young ladies. I, to me, it shines through as they're fighting whatever little they have to keep their dreams alive. I think that's good enough for me. Yes, thank you so much. I can tell you we are exactly at time and I wanted to thank every one of you so much. Thank you, thank you to Devorah, to Pranita, to Michelle, to Sasha. Um, I have to tell you uh, folks that I am feeling filled with hope, listening to your brilliance, your insights, your thoughtfulness about your how you're approaching the challenges that we are all facing. And I feel very, very hopeful for the future. I wanna close by thanking everyone who tuned in. Thank you for your questions. Sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. I also want to thank so much to um, Diana Ginsburg and Yael Shapira and so many others who have been so helpful at Olam to supporting us on this panel. And um, to those who are the funders of Olam, because we wouldn't be here without you. And um, this is a remarkable coalition of people. Um, I'm excited about the rest of the conference as I know you all are. And um, see you around virtually. And thank you again, be well, be safe. And thank you for tuning in. Bye-bye. <laughs>